Thank you, Phil. That might be one of the most intimidating introductions <laughs> I've ever had. Uh, this is also one of the more difficult plenaries that I've ever given. It's a topic that I, I talk about regularly in small groups, but we haven't really given a big public talk about. It's just a small topic, gender equity and ecology. You know, realistically, we could have a workshop for about a week on this topic, and we're going to try and pump it all into 45 minutes. The reason we uh, suggested this plenary and got it together over the last year was because around the world we're all realising, and there's a lot of energy at the moment on the gender equity issue, we're all realising that despite the fact we've had the vote for women for a hundred years or so, that we've had role reversals where women play every single technical role during the Great Wars, you know, that we've had the pill for 40 or so years, that we've had the feminist revolution, and yet in most developed countries we still have substantial gender inequality. And we have it, evidence of that in industry where you know, less than 5% of CEOs of the top 500 companies are women. This is evidence from the US where 6% you know, of the venture firm leaders are women, less than 20% of the politicians are women. And this sort of data, it's not, it's not just in the US, it's across the developed world. In fact, there are only a few exceptions where there are either, there have been very, very prescribed quotas um, in socially progressive countries and very, very prescribed quotas in very restrictive regimes. And that's the only countries that really stand out in a lot of this gender equity data. In Australia, we have similar issues in industry and in and government agencies. There are Liz Broderick's famous talk in 2012 where she said, you know, there are more um, women, they're, sorry, <laughs> there are more men named Peter running the big companies than there are women in total. Um, and, and this data, this fact was really quite astounding and it, it was subject to an ABC fact check and it came out true. In fact, the ABC found that uh, if you add up the, the men named Peter, David, Michael or Andrew, they outnumber the number of women running um, the companies four to one. So it says something about the way we name our children and it also says something um, about gender equity in Australia. But the, the big question today is of gender and I wanted to begin at this, right at the beginning by acknowledging that gender equity is only one aspect of diversity and we recognise that up front. We're apologetic that we haven't been able to deal with all of the other very many aspects of diversity and we hope to do that over the coming years. We're starting with gender equity. This is a photo of my lab group a couple of years ago. This is what we like to see in ecology, a nice mix, although we're, we might be considered somewhat ageist in this group. Um, so we're starting up front with saying just today we're dealing with gender equity and what are we talking about? Well, we're actually talking about is it a problem in ecology? If it is a problem, why? might it be a problem? What can individuals do about it? And what can organisations do? And we have had a team of people working to collect data on most aspects of this throughout the entire year. So it's been something of a labour of love, love that we've been doing on top of all of our other jobs. And I just wanted to begin with an image that shows all of the people who have been involved in collecting the data and the information that's gone into this uh, plenary. And you can see most of them are based at the University of Melbourne. There's also um, Deakin University. And uh, I just wanted to start right up front and say, all these people have done an incredible job. Mark and I are just the show ponies at the front. Um, so here we go with some of the data. This is the um, classic scissorgraph that you know um, you would be familiar with if you've read anything about um, women in science or women in research. And this is not our data, this is from 2012 from the Workplace Gender Equality Agency. And uh, you can see that whilst we have uh, in research many women involved in the junior levels, studying very hard, undergraduates, PhDs, we start to lose them as soon as we start moving up into senior levels in research. And it's been described as an incredible waste of resources amongst other things. It's a waste of talent, expertise, investment in the nation and it's not good for science. 
So in universities, I'm just going to click this on. Um, what's happening in particular, we've had uh, Pierre Lentini collecting this data. So universities employ 60% are women. But if you look at the managerial level, so all of the, all of the positions above technical staff, that drops down to 44%. If you look at the university boards, that drops down to 37%. And heads of school in ecology or biology, <coughs> so we're getting quite specific now, at 36%, which actually was surprisingly a good set of data there. Um, board chairs of boards, 22%. That's across all university data. So that's what we're able to collect on the universities. In that was very general data. Then we went in and looked at the actual schools of biology and ecology, identified staff who were um, self-identifying as ecologists. <coughs> this data is coming from 12 universities, six GO8 universities, six non-GO8 universities, and this is by level. So this is over, um, over uh, 15 years of time. And you can see the classic, this is a bilingual graph, it's a little bit of a different representation. But you can see women there in yellow, um, sorry, in, women are in purple and men are in uh, yellow. And as you go up the levels, um, we start with almost exact parity. And then by the time we get to level E, which is professor, then you can see that there are a lot of universities that have absolutely <coughs> zero female professors. Uh, and there are a lot of universities, uh, sorry, zero female professors. And it's the same at level um, D. We break that down a little bit, um, and so this is through time. So we have 2000, 2005, 2010, 2015. If you just focus on this last one here, um, 2015, you can see that we've shaded these by contract or ongoing. So at, at the beginning, at level A and B, you can see that there's almost gender parity, sometimes there's more women. So this is proportion, um, so the number of positions in total. So, um, And then as soon as you get to C, D or E, where you actually get the continuing positions, that's when the women seem to drop out and the men increase dramatically. And so we see that for ecology at least, and this is an interesting aspect in terms of how the leaky pipeline works. So in gender equity and STEM disciplines more broadly, we call the loss of women the leaky pipeline. But it leaks at different spots in different disciplines. So for chemistry, uh, it's usually after undergraduate. For maths, physics and engineering, we're losing them in high school. Uh, and for biology and ecology, it seems that we're not losing the women until after the first <laughs> Uh, postdoc. So it's actually a point at which you can you can narrow down the potential reasons why we're losing all of that talent because you can identify when most of the loss is taking place. The good news is that when you take the overall numbers through time, this goes from uh, 2000 to 2015, overall the proportion of women in the system is increasing through time and so it'll only take us 50 years to get to parity. <laughs> um, so let's look at a few other uh, domains because it's not just about employment, it's also about how well we're doing in different um, areas of research. So this is women on editorial boards and uh, you can see for some of the major ecology and conservation journals, this was published by Coedel in 2014. So some, some are going up in terms of portion of women on the editorial boards, others are just flatlining and they're flatlining at a really low level. So there's no parity at all in any of these, but some of them are improving. In terms of authors of published research papers, this is a mix, pull, pull this together. You can see Australia is sitting pretty much in the middle um, at about 30% of the authors of ecology papers uh, and Argentina is outstanding. Not quite sure why, but um, <laughs> that's just the, the total number of um, the total proportion of authors. If you look at a few specific journals that are relevant to ecologists, and you look at the proportion of women in those uh, areas, we we can see very different performances depending on the journal, and it does correlate at least for these five with impact factor. So as the impact factor goes up, 
uh, the number of women first authors goes down, which of course correlates with the seniority of the um, uh, employed ecologists in the system. It also apparently correlates with their confidence. Um, so Austral Ecology, big tick here, um, we're all up at 42%. Not a great tick for your impact at the moment. Um, so let's look at ARC grants. And uh, we've pulled this data out of the Australian Research Council. We've specifically pulled data associated with FOR, card, FOR codes that are ecology codes. So this is ecology specific information. Okay. Great, so we're quickly going to run through this. Women are definitely applying for fewer grants, uh, so that's the number of applications, but they also have a consistently lower success rate. It these are discovery grants, um, linkage grants that wasn't significant, uh, <coughs> different. Um, and depending on the level, doctor, associate professor, professor, you can see the big differences are happening down here at the doctor and the associate professor level. Consistently lower success rate, okay, so that's pretty shocking. Um, not at the professorial level, which was a comfort to me, of course. Um, and then ARC grant success by FOR code. This is where I'm going to finish because and this is really interesting segue into um, what Mark's going to talk about. Is there's differential successes depending on the field? Now that suggests to us that actually women can do science quite well, and their um, success rate can be equal to the male counterparts. But for some reason, and this is what Mark's going to get into, we get differential success depending on some sort of grouping. Now I know that we're all pretty good at all of these things. I know I'm just as good at tackling a crocodile as the other person, but what's happening here? So that's where I'm going to leave it with a big question why and Mark's going to come up and chat. I was coming back, the, 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 the talent is going to return. <laughs> um, I'm just a, I'm a gas filler here. But the, this has been a really interesting journey for me because um, it's, a, it's a different kind of topic and one that I know that many of us have, have discussed and, and been interested in for a long time. So it was really a journey to look back at the literature, look at the data to try and understand how my beliefs and my intuition about these problems married with the data, matched match the data or, did, as, or didn't as it turned out. And, uh, so this, there's been a bit, bunch of explanations about, about why it is that we have fewer women in senior positions, particularly in ecology, and they rest on the standard explanations of why we don't have women in STEM, the pipeline or the leak pipeline, personal choice or work-life balance, um, behavioural explanation, which is men are more likely to engage in dominant behaviours and initiate negotiations, and the glass ceiling, which is people, um, men and women, view women as less competent than men and lacking in leadership. Whatever that may be. So these are the explanations that Emma and I and the group, the, the, the large group, the, the Equity Collective, um, uh, want to posit a hypothesis that these in fact are not explanations, these are symptoms and there's an, a deeper underlying malaise and we're going to present some evidence for this hypothesis, some of it's indirect and some of it's direct and the, and the hypothesis is that these, these uh, symptoms are in fact a, a consequence of unconscious prejudice in us all, men and women, that we're still labouring with, that we haven't yet got over. And I'll show you some evidence, some evidence from my colleagues and some evidence from me of this unconscious bias, which is, of course, both gratifying and, and uh, depressing. Um, I'm not sure what's not. What am I doing wrong next? Oh, okay. Um, so the, the, the first of these is about personal, about personal choice and work-life balance. This is the topic of a of a, of a study that, was, that appeared recently in the Harvard uh, Business Review, nine studies, thousands of participants. The, the, concluding, the concluding paragraph was, one important reason that we, is that women believe, unlike many men, that, uh, that doing so would require them to compromise other important life goals. This is an interesting observation. It's, I think it's true. Uh, people do make different choices for different reasons, and they may be an association with gender associated with this kind of decision. And I'm going to return to this point about the decisions we make personally right at the end of my 15 minutes. We're also going to talk about behaviour, and I want to launch into that now about the behaviour of men and how that translates into how we're perceived and the things that, that people believe about us as, as men in these roles. So we've been doing some work on this in a different domain, in the domain of expert judgment, which has been a topic of the research in our lab for the last um, 
uh, half a dozen years or so. In philosophy, an argument from authority is that there is a naked assertion that the authority of the expert, the identity of the expert, warrants acceptance of the proposal. That is, you accept what I say because of who I am and not because of the substance of what I say. So you would accept it because I'm old and I've got a professorship and I'm in this university and I've got a letter after my name and all that sort of And so you think, well, he must have something. So, okay, we'll just listen to him. But of course, and, and symptoms in other disciplines, and these are three quotes that I've heard myself in, in, in my working life. I've been doing this for 20 years. This is a, this is a reason to believe me. It's got nothing to do with the substance of what I say. Or, who's the partner here? Or, do you have a qualification in this? I heard in a debate about, uh, about um, genetically modifiable organisms. I've got a qualification. You haven't. Shut up and listen. The psychologists call this the cognitive deficit model. That is, I know stuff. You don't. Just be quiet and listen because I'm going to tell you stuff. Right. Um, this is an experiment we did. We gave people, groups of people, 15 or 20 people, questions about that were relevant to their domain, the kinds of questions they have to answer in order to make judgments, technical judgments about questions of fact. And we gave this, we said, are these fair questions? And the groups eventually said, yes, these are fair questions. Then we said, okay, give yourself a score out of 10. How are you going to do on these things? Guess at how you're going to do. And so that people would write down two or three or seven, depending upon how confident they felt. And then we said, give a score to everybody else in the room. Give them a score out of 10 about how you think they're going to do. This is what we call a peer assessment. And they did it. And we found the average of those. And the striking thing is probably the only experiment I'll ever do in social science. The striking thing about this was the way in which you see yourself is almost identical to the way in which other people see you. These are deeply held social beliefs about questions of fact. And by the end of doing these workshops, we did about a, we did about a dozen of these, we could pick a person, how a person would be perceived by themselves or by other people as they walked in the room. If they came in, grey hair, glass on the end of the nose, rumpled suit, tie slightly askew, looking like everybody's grandfather or the grandfather they wish they had, they're going to get 9 out of 10. It didn't matter what they knew. And if they came in with a tattoo showing, 23 years old, female, they're going to get a 2 or a 3. They wouldn't just get the 2 or 3 from the group, they'll get the 2 or 3 from themselves. So if you believe this about yourself, this is the striking part. But then, of course, we can give them the questions. And this is where it gets exciting, of course. So we go to the questions. Do the assessments of either by your peers or by yourself, because the correlation is not eight five, remember, compared to performance. The answer is there is no correlation. It's zero. It's not weak, it is non-existent. Now you think, oh, there must be something wrong with this. Let me tell you, there isn't. <laughs> now, I don't have time to defend this. <laughs> If you think I'm old and I know stuff and these young people don't, then this has got to be wrong. I'm sorry. There are just no advantages to growing old. There are none. There are none. So, the fact, one of the facts about this is that the correlation with, with performance and self belief correlate, does correlate with, with, with your qualifications, your experience, your publications, and years in the field, and all that stuff you think must accumulate as knowledge. And yet it doesn't correlate with performance on judgments of fact. So, what is going on here? This is about unconscious prejudice. We are deluded about our performance. And these things correlate with your gender. As you get older, as you become less modest, you become more male. I mean, statistically speaking, I don't mean that as an individual. So, this, this, this expresses itself in a number of ways, and I'm going to zoom through this last part so that we have some time left. Um, this, is, this, this title of this experiment was a science fact was subtle, didn't it? It's not that subtle. They gave um, a, a CV, a single CV, to 126 HR departments in universities around the United States and simply randomised the first name to be either male or female and said, what would you offer this person if you employed them? And the difference was about 20% in the salary offering. That is, the men got 20% more in case you were wondering. <laughs> um, we did the same, they did this, a similar experiment with ins online college instructors, they randomly assigned male and female names and said, how did you judge a bunch of things, one of which was promptness, and this was, this was true of a bunch of criteria, and if the person was male, they said, oh, 4.5 out of 5, and the person was female, it was 3.5 out of 5, even though it was identical. These are unconscious prejudices held by both men and women. The point I want to make is, 
One of the points is that these job offers, the amount of money that people were offered, and the scores that people were given came from both men and women, and they were equal. So men and women hold these prejudices about women. And we've got to fix this. We've got to fix this. So, it's going to get worse before it gets better. <laughs> sexual harassment. I've been a sexual harassment advisor at the University of Melbourne for 20 years. I've done maybe 250 cases in that time. And the vast majority of those cases are relatively senior men taking advantage of circumstances related to relatively junior women. It's 90% of cases. It's not every case, and there are all permutations of this, and there are many subtleties and many interesting facets to this, but the vast majority of these are expressions of power. They're expressions of, of authority. And uh, there wouldn't be, I would doubt, a person in this room who hasn't observed sexual harassment in some form in the workplace if they've been in the workplace for more than 15 minutes. So what can we do? We speak up. We make sure there are advisors, we make sure there are policies, and we make sure that you do something about it when the time comes. When you see it, when you do it, uh, when, when you observe it, that is, you should do something about it. So, uh, so this is a personal journey, so I've got to do something about myself. I'm, I'm responsible for the journal Conservation Biology. We have this nice upward shape on our recruitment of women. I'm thinking, I'm feeling good about myself, isn't that terrific? I'll keep this policy in mind. But I also looked at the frequency with which I reject papers from men and women. Because I do it blind. I don't look at the names. I just do I, I make a rejection and then I look at the names. And it seems, unfortunately, I don't know if I can get this to work. Oh yes, over here. You can see this is the editors before me. Overall, this is Erica Fleischmann. This is um, a couple of other people. One of these people is uh, in here amongst his set is Nick McCarthy. They're all doing very well. There's no biases against women. And look over here. Unfortunately, I seem to reject papers from women more often than I reject papers from men. It's only a little bit. You won't think, but it's significant. And that three or five or four or five percent adds up over time. It adds up substantially over time. So I've got to think: Why am I doing this? What's leading to this? And how is it coming about? And the answer is: I don't know. I'm still examining this question. The only way you can become aware of unconscious bias is to measure things. Is to collect data about yourself. And examine it. There is no other way because, by definition, you don't know what's going on with the best will in the world. All right, um, we need to be careful with language. I, I do have to, to wrap this up now. Um, the, the, this is a, I went to conferences. I, 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 between the period when we start, decided to do this and now, I started to collect information uh, serendipitously. I went to conferences. These are just the first conference I went to after we made the decision. And these are comments that people made that are gen unnecessarily gender referenced and demeaning to women. You think, well, why, are we, why do we use these expressions? It's blah, it's, it's, it's curious and strange. But what speaks all the more loudly is the composition of the people who spoke, the panel. What, now there's something, there's something. what do these people have in common? It's like a game you spend do as a kid. Well, they've got, they've got some of their facial hair, their, their European extraction. Oh, hello, they're a bit lady to men. Well, <laughs> surprise, surprise. The panel challenges, make sure there are women on the panel, make sure they're equally represented, or don't participate. Um, I, I, I collected data on questions. Uh, in, in, I won't summarise this information. In general, in ecology, women ask far fewer questions than men, and they never ask the first question. Unless they're Emma or, <laughs> or one or two other people. <laughs> um, so, what can we do? There's a there's a there's a there's a, 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 a strategy in in. In, in literature called Lean In, in which women need to be more assertive, the claim is, need to be more assertive in board meetings and in, and in interactions with their colleagues and so on. I would like to add to this that we also should lean out. I've put Terry Speed's picture on this because he speaks about women's issues, uh, one of the few that does publicly, um, without his permission, I've got to say. Um, that is, the men amongst us don't be the first person to ask the question. If you've got a really great question, Someone else has probably thought of it. Just, just hold tight, hold, hold your shop, just don't speak up, and let someone else speak. Especially if you're older, let someone younger speak, and make sure you're the last person in the room to speak. Make that a, a way of behaving from now on, so that the, a, a symptom of the ecological society of Australia is that a man never asks the first question in a seminar or a, or a workshop. Ever. Yeah. From now on. <laughs> are we are we agree? <laughs> no, <man. laughs> No, I'm not there. Fine, fine. We'll, we'll press on. So what can we do? I've got to finish here. We've got to speak up. We've got to call out sexual harassment and discrimination. We just have to say something. Um, we need to monitor our own 
behaviors. Um, we need to take care of this language, we need to take the panel challenge, I need to become involved, and, and for, for men, lean in at home, lean out at work. Thanks. So it's not just about having the first question, it's about having the last word, which is why I'm up here again. <laughs> so Mark has really uh, nicely explained some of the ideas behind unconscious prejudice. Um, and there are tests you can do online if you haven't heard about them already uh, to look at your own unconscious biases. And I highly recommend, if you haven't done it already, get online, do one of the tests and just see exactly where your unconscious biases lie. Once they are recognised, at least you can start addressing them yourself. Now, what we're going to talk about now is beyond the individual. There is a lot going on in organisational space in terms of gender equity and what I'm going to talk to you about today is what you might expect to see happening over the next three to five years in your institutions. Uh, this is going across uh, research organisations, research funding organisations, universities, uh, institutions like CSIRO and some of it's really exciting and some of it's really dull and I'm going to start with the dull bit. So the ARC just released their new gender equity plan for 2015-2016 which I've got to say was mostly let's do more of the same which was a little bit disappointing. I've highlighted three of the things that were more exciting and slightly different so one is they are going to look at the gender balance and try to improve the gender balance of their panels uh, another is that they are going to make the uh, C uh, centres of excellence have a gender equity policy, which is useful. And another is that they will investigate options for unconscious bias training. Okay, so that's what's happening with the ARC, but really they've been completely gazumped by the NH and MRC, who uh, have announced a rather much stronger gender equity policy and in fact have put a little tick the box on your grant application to essentially say if your organisation from which you are making this grant application from does not have a gender equity policy and that that gender equity policy does not recognise that there is an issue and that we are losing medical researchers and we're losing lots of talent and have um, policies in place to redress that balance then you can't even get any funding. So that's actually changed the whole landscape and you would not believe the number of universities who are scurrying around writing gender equity policies right now. Uh, and most universities do have a medical um, department. So that's having a huge impact and um, it, will, it will influence all of us because the gender equity policies that are being developed are not just for the medicos even though we think they might need them more than us. So um, there is another program going on, which you may have heard about. just wanted to quickly introduce that to you. So the SAGE program, or the Athena Swan SAGE program, it's a gender equity program that's been going in the UK for about three years now, and essentially asks all of the universities and research organisations to sign up to a principle or a charter of principles. There are 10 principles that need to be recognised about gender equity. And then once they've signed up to that charter, they have to do a whole lot of self-reporting. And it's incredible the amount of change that can be made when the data is there because people like evidence and they will base policy changes on evidence. And so this is happening now in Australia. Once they've uh, collected their evidence, they apply for grading and they can get a gold, silver or bronze um, grading. Right now in the UK, if you're not getting a silver grading on these issues, then you cannot get medical research funding. Um, so this is being trialled in Australia this year. So half of the universities in Australia will be part of the pilot for the SAGE trial. And uh, we're expecting that it will be implemented relatively soon. It's self-guided. Uh, people have come up with their own policies for their own universities, which is a good thing because, as we've seen already, depending on the discipline that you're working in, there will be different points in the leaky pipeline and different issues that need specific um, attention. But what the university is already doing, this data was collected by Pia Lentini um, from the Workplace Gender Equality Agency data sets. And if you want to look at this, there's a lot of data online. Um, this is where the policies are currently sitting. Now, there's a lot of information in this slide. I'm not going to go through it. But basically, most universities currently have sexual harassment policies that are specific standalone policies. Uh, and they've been dealing with those for some time with various levels of success. 
but very few of them have um, acknowledgement of gender issues or gender equity issues within their recruitment policy. And that's where we're really seeing ecologists in um, universities, in CSIRO, in AIMS, etc. is that that position where they're getting their first continuing position and it's a recruitment problem. So that's one issue that probably needs a lot more addressing uh, within the policy realm and then also within the unconscious bias realm. Um, many of them are now currently developing policies, as I just said, because of the NH and MRC. What are the journals doing? We did a survey of all the ecology journals, 142, and this was again led by PIA, and uh, we got a 70% return rate on this simple survey, which is, I think, the highest return rate I've ever heard of. Uh, so that's good. 30% um, of the journals who responded are using double-blind review, and many of you will have heard of double-blind review. It's very effective in at least slowing down the rate at which um, unconscious bias is applied. And uh, so that's a promising sign, and we're expecting that may also be uh, introduced into grant funding processes. It's going to be a lot harder to do so, but it's certainly turning up in journals. Uh, only 17% have carried out a formal analysis of um, gender bias in the journals, and we did have quite a few who responded relatively negatively, saying it's just not an issue, we don't have a problem, we're completely fair. Um, and they were the people who hadn't done a gender bias analysis. Um, <laughs> and so um, only 10% had a gender equity policy. So we've, we've got a way to go. But I want to end the plenary on a positive note. And this is about Ecological Society of Australia itself. Um, things have changed very, very rapidly. It was 1963, we had 10% of the membership were female. It's 2010, my last data point, 55% of the membership are women. And if you look at that trajectory, it's the boys that are in trouble. Um, <laughs> but that's the membership. And of course, we had our first female uh, president elected in 1994, the wonderful Marilyn Fox, who was also the first female medal, women, medal winner. Um, we've since had three more female presidents, Jan Williams, Carla Cattrall and Chris French. And so if you look just from 1994 onwards, it's been about 50% of the presidents have been female. So things are looking up for the Ecological Society of Australia and for ecologists more generally. And we still have some work to do. This is the um, number of speakers in the conferences from 2010 to 2015. Overall, 50% of the presentations are coming from women, but of the invited talks, it's about 20%, 25%. And that's partly a seniority issue, and it's also partly unconscious bias on panels when they're selecting speakers. So we really need to have a policy in place that really tries to redress that and get more women up here on the podium for the invited talks. At this conference, two out of the nine keynote speakers were female, and I'm one of them, and I'm talking about gender equality. <laughs> so, no, I don't think I count. Um, one other thing, in, we've been taking data, you might have noticed a few people, Mick McCarthy in particular, has always been at the start of each plenary, he's been taking um, gender equity information about the constituency of the audience, that's you guys, for all of the plenaries, and it's been consistently 50% and we were just a little bit concerned that we might not have, we might have a little bit of a different ratio for this particular plenary and I'm super pleased to say that the numbers have come in. Mix DM'd me on Twitter and we have a 50-50 ratio again uh, for this plenary. So congratulations to you. <laughs> Um, it's great that all of us are here, that we're talking about this. The, the plenary that we've given this morning was partly to present the data, partly to get us thinking, but really to get us talking and discussing this issue. Um, it's an issue that if you don't keep your eye on it, things get worse. If you keep talking about it, things get better, and we don't lose all of that incredible talent, and we don't lose all of that incredible perspective that is currently being lost from ecology as senior women um, lose out. What does the Ecological Society of Australia have in place as a policy? Well, they're working on it, so stay tuned. We're, we're hoping that we see a gender equity policy for the Ecological Society of Australia in 2016. Thank you very much.